Hello everyone, um, welcome to this session of my course, Appreciating Linguistics, a Typological Approach. So far the sample that uh, the typologists have worked on, uh, you might, um, you, you kind of, you might encounter new languages later, new languages might be um, identified uh, by the researchers and maybe uh, the generalization may not hold true for that, but as, as of now the huge sample that has been studied so far by the typologist gives us uh, like gives uh, give, give us an idea that many of the worlds or like almost all the worlds uh, all the words in the world's languages they will surely have at least one vocalic segment that means there must be one vowel uh, found in, in in all the words in any of the world's languages that is about the first generalization. And the, what is the second generalization? The second generalization is about vowel um, harmony. So, when you look at uh, when you look at vowel harmony, you see that vowel harmony is more frequent across languages than consonant harmony. Consonants might have varied forms. Some might have a stressed, some might have uh, non-stressed, some could have um, let us say in case of per and per or ter and ter difference. Um, some languages might have uh, um, it, it, it could be an aspirated form. So, aspirated k, aspirated t and aspirated p may not be available in many of the world's languages. So, the consonants they may not have as harmonious presence as the vowel harmony. So, second generalization remember it carefully in case like if you compare the vowels and the consonants it is vowels whose harmony is more frequent across languages then the consonant harmony. Consonants might be um, varied, it might be there could be um, there could be wide variation among the usage or among the um, pronunciation of consonants, but in most of the cases in the phonological segments of world's languages the vowel harmony is found more frequently. And these are the statistical statements when I say more or more frequent that means I am talking about it is basically um, the statistical presence or the statistical indication. So, vowel harmony is more frequent, consonant harmony is less frequent. Then second, um, second generalization is also related to the harmony discussion that means the vowel height harmony is more frequent across languages than palatal harmony. So, when you talk about um, when you talk about the height of the high or the low vowel, so in that case also the height of the vowel is more uh, is more harmonious or you can say is more uniformly available than the palatal harmony. So, whether the the manner of utterance or the or the manner of articulation if not if not utterance the manner of articulation and in the place of articulation when you are talking about the palatal reason or the or the palatal harmony that is less frequent than the height harmony of the um, of the verb uh, height harmony of the word. Then the fourth generalization is about another um, another reference or another uh, indication of harmony in sound forms. So, when you are talking about choice of sound and sound forms we uh, see that as stated in generalization 4 most languages that have labial harmony also have some other kind it might have palatal harmony it might have uh, nasal harmony. So, labial harmony is considered to be the, the most rudimentary form of this. So, if, if per is pronounced as per in most of the languages then obviously, uh, obviously nasal uh, sounds like m, uh, n they will also be uh, pronounced in the same harmony um, like the, the labial one. So, labials are the most rudimentary one remember this. So, the fourth generalization is about labial harmony which is found or which um, or the or the, the languages or most of the languages which have labial harmony will also have some other kinds of harmony. So, um, that means labial harmony would be considered as the most rudimentary form of the um, syllables. Okay. Now, let us uh, look at this uh, how the the words or how the how the sounds are chosen within syllables. Within a given syllable what sort of choices do we have as far as sounds are concerned. Let us say bitten and little uh, that is in English, 
uh, in Czech also you have three different words sedan, wilk and kirk. So, that is seven wolf and neck then there is this is a language which is uh, up for which is actually difficult for me to pronounce, but then here also you see um, there is an exception. In this case uh, you do not really see any uh, look at the data number 6 you do not find any vocalic or the syllabic sound. So, then the concern is does that mean that the first generalization is nullified here. We are not very sure this could be an exception and uh, probably will will take up or we will discuss such kind of data at length later maybe in another course. But as of now you need to uh, you need to remember that in most of the cases uh, as far as the generalizations are concerned uh, or harmony of uh, the sounds concerned vowel harmony is more frequent than consonant harmony. Second vowel height harmony is more frequent than the palatal harmony and in most languages that have labial harmony will also have the harmony of some other kinds. It could be dental, it could be um, it could be nasal, it could be labiodental or whatever right. Okay. So, with these uh, generalizations we would move to the uh, fifth generalization that we have uh, within um, syllables. So, uh, there are three sections or there are three, um, three parts of this generalization. The first one let me read it, the first one is the occurrence of syllabic liquids, liquids like l sound in a language almost always implies that of syllabic nasals. Let me read it one by one then we will get back to the data. Second one the occurrence of syllabic stops in a language always implies the occurrence of syllabic fricatives. The occurrence of syllabic voiceless stops in a language always implies the occurrence of syllabic voiceless stopped. So, that means these are the implicational universals. If x is there then y will also be there, but that does not mean that if y is there x will be there not really. So, it will always move from x to y direction right. So, if it moves from x to y then we will find out which one is the implication of what. I um, will focus on the first one first. So, generalization 5a what is it written? It is written the occurrence of syllabic liquids in a language almost always implies that of syllabic nasals. So, that means in a language if we have a syllabic liquid that language will definitely have syllabic nasal. So, in a syllable if you have liquids you can always have nasals too. So, liquids and nasals they are in the implicational category. The second one is related to syllabic stops and syllabic fricatives. So, let us see let us read um, the occurrence of syllabic stops in a language will always imply the occurrence of syllabic fricatives. So, uh, the first one is liquid to nasal if there are syllabic liquids there would be syllabic nasals. The second one if there are syllabic um, stops there will also be syllabic fricatives uh, and what is the third one? If there is a syllabic voiceless uh, stop then there, there would definitely be a syllabic voiced stop ok. So, let me give you some examples of all the three things that will help you to understand. So, these are um, ok let me write it over here um, liquids. I would uh, rather ask you to go back to the um, the sounds or the place of articulation manner of articulation consonant and the vowel um, vowel chart that we had in the previous discussion. So, we have uh, liquids and uh, um, let us say liquids versus nasals that is one category. We have stops versus fricatives, then we have uh, let us say voiceless stop. So, um, when I let us let us look at the liquids that we have when we have uh, um, let us say uh, liquid ok we will come back to the fifth generalization that we have been discussing. Um, the first part of the fifth generalization is 
the occurrence of syllabic liquids in a language almost always implies that of syllabic nasals. So, when I say um, liquids, let us say I have the this l and it will surely have the implication of ma. If it has syllabic liquid, it will have syllabic nasal. Then the second generalization is if it has a syllabic stop, let us say p, then it will surely um, have a fricative that is f. Okay. Then the third one, if it has a voiceless stop p, then it will surely have a voiced stop b. Okay. So, these are the three parts or these are the three uh, segments or the three sections of the fifth generalization. L syllable or uh, syllabic liquid like syllabic liquid will imply to, uh, to uh, syllabic nasal, syllabic stop will imply to syllabic fricative and syllabic voiceless stop will imply to syllabic voiced stop. Right? In other words, uh, if I can say syllabic nasals are preferred over syllabic liquids, syllabic fricatives are preferred over syllabic stops and voiced stops are preferred over voiced or oh sorry voiceless um, voiced stops are preferred over voiceless ones. Okay. So, maybe um, to write these three uh, generalizations, I am going to I am going to rephrase it as done by Morabzik. Um, so, which one is preferred over what? So, I will say syllabic nasals are preferred over syllabic liquids. Similarly, syllabic stops are um, preferred over syllabic fricatives and voiceless stops are preferred over voiced stops. So, this is what the fifth generalization would tell us um, as far as the phonological system, um, system is concerned. Okay? Now, let us move to um, the, the, these are a form of sounds you might have a look at it when you have time. So, I have examples from Korean, um, then basically more abstract examples from Spanish, um, then we have Korean, then we have uh, again Spanish. So, basically two different languages which have been discussed here, just look at the data carefully sometimes, but remember this is what the generalization has been drawn. Um, syllabic nasals over syllabic liquids, um, syllabic fricatives over syllabic stops and voiced stops over the voiceless stops. So, check the data later, I am not going to discuss much about the data now, uh, rather I would move to the next generalization. So, what is the next generalization? Let us read it first and then we will see how we can explain um, this generalization in a, in a simpler term. So, the sixth generalization says, in final systems, the existence of at least one sequence consisting of a nasal, whether it is voiced or unvoiced, followed by heteroorganic obstruent implies the existence of at least one sequence consisting of nasal followed by a homoorganic homo -organic obst obstruent. So, this, these are uh, these are heavily loaded phonological terms, but let us see how simple we can make it for you to understand. Right? So, one is homoorganic, the other one is heteroorganic and homoorganic uh, nasals and heteroorganic nasals, they and, and it is it is mentioned that they occur before the obstruents and what are the uh, what are the obstruents here that is what we need to uh, find out. So, what are the exa first let us see what are the examples of homoorganic uh, clusters. Uh, for example, the words like um, limp or slant these are the homoorganic word final nasal stop clusters. Okay. So, I am going to write here a couple of data. So, um, in case of English, let me write a word like limp or, um, or let us say slant, slant. 
slant or limp these have these are the homo organic um, these are what homo organic word final nasal stop clusters word final nasal stop clusters. Now, let us see what are the heterogeneous ones. Okay. So, when you when you think about the homogeneous ones, we also need to find out what could be the um, what could be the heter heterogeneous ones. And in case of uh, heterogeneous ones, um, you generally uh, generally the nasals are considered to be homo organic. But in case of uh, um, in case of hetero organic ones, uh, just a minute. Okay, Kartik, just just hold on for a while. There is some confusion here. So let's see uh, how the six generalization works. Uh, before that, you need to remember a couple of things that I have scribbled over here uh, on the screen. Uh, what it says. Let's read it again. Six generalization says in final systems, the existence of at least one sequence consisting of a nasal followed by a heterogenic obstruent, obstruent implies the existence of at least one sequence consisting of a nasal uh, followed by a homo organic obstruent. A couple of words you need to understand what is an obstruent, the sound it is already written there, the obstruents are the sounds which are produced by an obstruction in the air flow um, and generally and only the consonants can be the obstruents and what is the opposite of obstruent sonorants. Sonorants do not generally have the obstruction in the workflow, uh, sorry, in the airflow. Um, that is why it could be both consonants and um, and vowels. Okay, um, sonorant could be either consonant or vowel. Obstruents are are uh, only vowels. That's what you need to remember. There is an obstruction, the sound would be obstruent. No obstruction, the sound would be sonorant. And what is it saying? What is the six generalization saying? And then, then there are two different concepts which are discussed here. One is homo organic, the other one is hetero organic. Um, homo organic consonants are those which are occurring at the same place of articulation. Let us say p, b, and m, these are the homo organic consonants, right. But p and, and uh, let us say ch, they would be hetero organic consonants when the place of articulation is different. Uh, when the place of articulation is same, you, you call it homo organic, right. So, now let us see how this homo organic and the hetero organic obstruents are listed or are accounted for in the sixth generalization. So, the, the what it says the existence of at least one sequence consisting of nasal followed by your hetero organic obstruent implies that at least one sequence consisting of a nasal followed by a homo organic uh, obstruent. That means, if uh, a sequence consisting of a nasal either voiced or unvoiced, it is followed by a hetero organic obstruent, it implies that there must be at least one sequence consisting of a nasal which is followed by a homo, uh, homo organic uh, constraint, uh, sorry homo organic obstruent. So, let us say um, a nasal like n if it is followed by a p or b um, um, or less sorry a n if it let us say a m if it is followed by a ch then it will surely be followed by a p because p and n these are the homo organic consonants p and ch are the hetero organic consonants or n and ch are the hetero organic consonants so, one nasal which is followed by your hetero organic obstruent, let us say a nasal m is followed by ch at the final system, it will surely have at least one more sequence where the nasal m would be followed by a homo organic obstruent like p. So, m followed by ch will have at least one instance where m followed by p. So, these are the phonological, um, phonological context or you can say the phonological boundary or the phonological system which decides uh, which decides how the nasal sound with a homo organic obstruent is going to imply with a uh, in relation with a hetero organic obstruent right so uh, to understand the sixth generalization um, i would expect you to understand first what is an obstruent what is a sonorant what is a homo organic consonant and what is a 
heteroorganic consonant. Once you understand these four terms easily, uh, sorry, four, these four terms you can easily understand the sixth generalization. I have already written on the screen there are two examples limp and slant. Um, when you say limp, the m and then the n, m and p, they have the homoorganic word final thing. N and t, these are also homoorganic. But if there is a combination of l i m t, then there would surely be a combination of l i m p. That is what because m and p, these are homoorganic, but m and t are not homoorganic, they are heteroorganic ones. So, the implicational universal is that in case of a nasal followed by a hetero, hetero organic obstruent implies that there would be a nasal followed by a homo organic um, obstruent. If you find it difficult or tricky to understand, please get back to me, but I would expect you to know the basics of phonology or basics of phonetics first to understand the generalizations. Go back to my basic discussions also that is do not be limited to that, do not keep yourself restricted to these discussions. Please read as much as you can, so that the understanding of next set of generalizations is going to be easy of you. At least for the sixth one, obstruent, sonorant, homorganic, heterogonic need to be understood correctly. So, I would stop today's discussion with these set of six generalizations and um, in the next session, I will talk about a few more related to phonological typology. Until then, please listen to the videos carefully and then read as much as you can look at the data given in um, introducing language typology book by Edith Moravzik, so that these understandings are going to be clearer. Thank you, we will come back to another session of phonological typology soon.